We are currently teetering on the brink of a major war between nuclear superpowers. If it went nuclear at a moment's notice, what are the first things you should do to keep you and your family safe? Let's talk about it. All of the following suggestions assume that you will have made some preparations beforehand and have conducted a brief area study of your region. For a deeper dive into these preparedness topics, please see the links in the description that provide a wealth of information on skills, gear, and strategy. Stay tuned until the conclusion of this video to access a comprehensive list of recommended gear. In the film The Miracle Mile, there's a gripping scene where people learn about incoming nuclear bombs with just 15 minutes left. Panic ensues leading to chaotic scenes. However, what if it's an information blackout? How will you be able to decode the situation and respond appropriately? How will you know if it's an isolated nuclear incident or full-blown nuclear war? And what do you do immediately afterwards? Most nuclear war survival guides relate to surviving the acute phase of a disaster. It typically goes something like this. In the event of an imminent attack warning, take cover quickly, below ground if possible, Act swiftly to seek shelter and gather supplies as time is of the essence. Follow the authorities' instructions and stay in your chosen shelter unless instructed otherwise. You may need to stay there up to two weeks until the radioactive fallout dissipates. If you're outdoors and an attack is imminent, locate the nearest building. Brick or concrete structures are preferred. If there's no basement, go inside and position yourself towards the center of the building. If you find yourself caught out in the street during an explosion, lie on the ground facing downwards away from the direction of the blast. This will protect your vital organs from projectiles emitted from the high pressure blast wave of the detonation. This is all great advice, but the reality is it's likely not going to be so cut and dry. So here's a hypothetical scenario for you to consider. A nuclear incident has occurred on NATO soil. You caught wind of the news before it switched to the emergency alert system. You don't know the details or the extent of the incident, but you know that something major has happened and you don't know what else could potentially happen. This could be a terrorist attack, or it could be the targeting of critical infrastructure, military installations, or strategic forces by a nation state adversary. Or it could be the beginning of a full-scale nuclear war, which would mean all major metropolitan areas were at risk of nuclear attack. There's simply no way of knowing for sure what's going to be going on in this situation. Even if it was only one city impact, the government would still be so overwhelmed that you should expect a major long-term disruption in services. And the government will likely immediately impose martial law to quell any unrest that arises. You may be in a rural setting far removed from the event. If so, your job is to stay put, and you will need to determine if you're in the path of fallout. You can do so by accessing numerous nuclear fallout projection maps online prior to any event. If you live in a major city, however, you may want to consider temporarily evacuating if you have the means to do so. You want to do this before everyone gets the same idea at the same time and the roads are clogged. If you live near military bases or Minuteman missile silos, you may also want to consider temporarily relocating. Step 1. Muster and Roll Call Locate all your loved ones, friends, and extended family if possible. Consider having everyone muster to whoever's home is the safest location. Having a large group will be beneficial if there is a prolonged disruption of services. Bear in mind, this will only be possible if you have ample lead time, and the distance between you and your loved ones is minimal and there's not the imminent threat of a nuclear strike. If at all possible, have someone in your home start filling everything with water. You'll want to do this while there's still pressure in the pipes. If the grid goes down, it could be a long time before the taps start flowing again. Put any electronic devices that you think you might need into a Faraday cage. This will protect these devices from the electromagnetic pulse effects of the nuclear detonation. Things like radios, phones, flashlights, or anything with fine circuitry that might be damaged should be put in a Faraday cage. If you want to know how to build a Faraday cage, check out this video here. Step 2. Information Gathering Utilizing any means at your disposal, from cell phones, AM FM radio, weather band, shortwave radio, police scanner, marine VHF, or amateur radio to acquire as much information as you possibly can. One great way to communicate with your loved ones is satellite phones or messengers. These will be one of the few long-range communications devices that will work over great distances during the initial phases of nuclear attack. 
They could, however, be susceptible to cyber and electronic warfare or the electromagnetic pulse effects of a high-altitude nuclear blast. But there is a reason why every senator in the USA was recently offered a satellite phone for emergency communications. It's not surprising that in the current geopolitical climate, this raised some eyebrows. Chances are the emergency alert system will be operational, but don't rely on it solely for information. There are two realities. Number one, you don't know if the emergency alert information is accurate and up to date, so it should only be viewed as supplementary. And number two, the authorities have a vested interest in continuity of government planning, and that may take precedent over communicating the severity and depth of the situation to the populace so to minimize panic congest the roadways, and interfere with military operations. Even if the emergency alert messages are true, you will be getting that info at the same time as everyone else. Every step ahead of the information curve you can be will be very advantageous to avoid gridlock or to start planning your next move. Bear in mind that throughout this time, there may also be attempts by our adversaries to use information warfare to lead people astray. If you have previously determined that you're in the path of fallout, there is little time for anything else. It's time for you to move everything you need into a shelter immediately. You can determine the pathway of fallout by comparing the prevailing winds and weather reports in your region with the potential nuclear target sites as shown on this map. Step 3. A final supply run. If there's no risk of imminent attack where you're located, and your credit cards are still functional, you might want to consider maximizing their use for prepping supplies while you still can. Chances are that ATMs and debit machines will eventually stop working. But depending on your location, it may take a few days for the situation to fully deteriorate, although looting could begin immediately. If there is a window of opportunity to do a last minute supply run, you should take it. Typically, the average person has only three to seven days worth of food in their home. And beyond that, the situation can rapidly deteriorate. It's after this three to seven day period where people are gonna start getting desperate. This is when you're gonna see a major uptick in looting and crime. As soon as you hear about a nuclear incident happening somewhere, gather as much cash as you can, as it likely will still be accepted during the initial stages of societal breakdown. Its value may diminish only when the public's confidence in the government's ability to stabilize the situation wanes. Stockpile additional food resources whenever possible. Even if you're self-sufficient, consider doing so for your neighbors. They may need assistance, and building a support network is crucial. Prioritize high-calorie foods for sustenance. Stock up on medication. This might mean a last-minute pharmaceutical supply run. Stock up on vitamins and don't forget toiletries. You will need a sanitary way of disposing your waste so to minimize the risk of disease. Stock up on gasoline. Fill every possible jerry can you can. If you have propane canisters and can still fill them up, do so. Even if you don't own a diesel vehicle or a diesel generator, get as much as you can because it might come in handy later. Someone in your community may be able to use it and you may be able to trade. When stocking up, consider the needs of your area. Is it winter time? Or is it about to be winter? How long will you be able to heat your home in the case of a complete grid collapse? At this time, if possible, procure as much firewood as you can. It's important to understand that most of these things you're gonna have to do beforehand, but you need to seize on any window of opportunity to do a last minute supply run that you can. Step number four, operational security. Operational security or OPSEC can be a critical concern and its importance depends on your circumstances. If others are aware of your prepper status, you may become an immediate target very early in the crisis. On the other hand, if your preparedness remains more discreet, it can buy you some valuable time. For example, if the government is handing out rations or meals ready to eat, you should get in line even if you don't necessarily need them. This gray man tactic communicates desperation and will minimize the risk that people might think you have something that they need. However, it's essential to strike a balance Share resources strategically without drawing undue attention to yourself. It's important to remember that as much as desperate people may be liabilities, they may also be assets. If you have an off-grid power supply, it's wise to avoid excessive cooking and power consumption, as these activities can attract unwanted attention. As desperation grows, people's senses will become more heightened, making it crucial to maintain a low profile. It should go without saying that security should be top of mind from the get-go, but increasingly more so as the situation deteriorates. 
If there is a window of opportunity to stockpile ammunition, that's an opportunity that you should probably take. In the event of a complete government collapse, power vacuums will most definitely emerge in your community. It's essential to identify the influential figures or leaders within your community in advance of any such event. It's highly possible that municipal law enforcement and gangs will vie for control over your region. If your community fails to organize and assert itself, you may find yourself under the control of one of these groups, which would be detrimental to your safety and well-being. Beware of imposters during times of crisis. Some individuals, possibly even those claiming to be law enforcement, may falsely assert authority to confiscate your belongings. They might allege that they're acting on behalf of the federal government's continuity plan, but how can you be certain? It's crucial to verify the legitimacy of their claims, even if their story checks out. You and your community will need to assess whether or not you believe these orders are legitimate and have your best interests in mind. In situations like these, numerous complications can arise. It's worth noting that many governments have war powers declarations that grant them the authority to seize property during wartime. Familiarizing yourself with the relevant laws can be essential for making informed decisions. In previous videos, we've explained how to conduct area studies to familiarize yourself with your surroundings before disaster strikes. We've conducted extensive interviews with nuclear experts on the topic of detection and treating radiological injuries. We've also shown you how to build nuclear preparedness survival bug out bags. We've interviewed nuclear fallout shelter and bunker experts. We've also done videos that breaks down all of the less obvious indicators that nuclear war might be imminent. We would strongly encourage anybody who is serious about preparing for a widespread radiological emergency to watch and download those videos. Here is a list of items to get prepared for the worst of worst case scenarios. Number one. The book, Nuclear War and Survival Skills. Number two, a shortwave radio like this Kaido radio shown here. Number three, a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear NATO 40 millimeter gas mask. Number four, a level B hazmat suit like this Haz suit by Mira Safety. Number five, MREs and or freeze dried food. Number six, a luggable loo and sanitation agents in order to manage human waste. Number seven, antibiotics and prescription medications. You can get these from jacemedical.com. See the link in the description. For a complete list of nuclear war survival gear, check out this video here. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at canadianpreparedness.com where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code prepping gear for 10% off. Don't forget the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.